Perceive, process, perform. Do you need inspiration for your practice? Or do you simply need to practice inspiration? With this series, we aim to do both. Give us 15 minutes and we'll give you practice inspiration. Dave Weber's brand of no-nonsense advice blended with enthusiastic humor has made him a favorite for many events in the Seattle Study Club network. He can always be counted on to wake you up and help find the joy in what we do every day. Hi, I'm humorist and professional speaker Dave Weber, and today I want to share with you an amazing simple strategy to help you intentionally build excellence into your life. Now, you'll notice I didn't say into your job or your practice or your team, but rather your life. You see, whenever I present, I assume everyone I'm talking to is a whole person. Now, that's whole with the W. And what I mean by that is, I'm assuming you're not just an employee or an owner of some entity. Today, I'm assuming you're a spouse, you're a parent, you're a son or a daughter, a brother or a sister, you're a roommate, a next door neighbor, a church attender or a health club member. Now, let's be honest, you hadn't been in three months, but you keep paying the bill. And I'm assuming that there's also a wide and varied audience watching this that might do a whole lot of different jobs. And what I try to bring to the table are truths that everyone can implement and that have equal application at your kitchen table at home as they do your conference table at work. Now, today's truth was actually born about 2,400 years ago when the great Greek philosopher Aristotle said these words, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Let me see that again. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Now, when I'm presenting live in front of an audience, I typically at this point in time give everyone the opportunity to try and restate what they think Aristotle meant or kind of put his words into their own words. Inevitably, people will yell out things like, you know, we're creatures of habit or you are what you do, not what you say. And because I'm from the Deep South and get to do a lot of presentations down there, I get to hear some amazing redneck wisdom. Uh, a couple of my favorites are this. I can't hear what you're saying because you're doing is so loud. Or probably my all-time favorite is this one. Your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Isn't that great? I love that. Well, inevitably, somebody always yells out the famous adage, say it with me, practice makes perfect. Exactly right. And it sounds great. Trouble is, it's just not true. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. In fact, let me prove to you what I mean. If I were to go to a golf driving range and get a large bucket of balls, get out to the range and grab that first ball, stick it on the tee, pop it in the ground, get my driver out, get all lined up. And if I were to rear back and hit that golf ball and it took off and then bent to the right and landed in the woods. And I grabbed another golf ball and I put it on that tee and I grabbed my driver and I cut loose with that baby and it took off and bent to the right into the woods. And if I did that, oh, if I practiced that over and over and over, am I creating a perfect golf swing? No, I am programming myself to hit that stinking slice into the wood, woods every single time. And what, what we've got to learn how to do is realize that practice doesn't make perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect. Let me tell you who I learned that lesson from. Now, unless you're a golf fan, you might not recognize the name Larry Nelson. Larry is a retired PGA professional, and his story is one that I find fascinating. Larry never picked up a golf club until he was 21 years old after coming back from the Vietnam War. The first time he played a round of golf, he broke 100, which most golfers never do. Within nine months of picking up a club, Larry was consistently shooting scores in the 60s and was encouraged by everyone at his club, dude, go for the tour. 
Well, he did and was an amazing success. During his career, Larry won 32 professional tournaments, including three majors, and today is in the Golf Hall of Fame. Well, Larry lives in the community where I live. And my son Logan, who was 10 years old at the time, came barreling into our house one afternoon like the Energizer Bunny on Red Bull. Dad, Dad, I just found out Larry Nelson is teaching a free clinic at the country club before the tournament on Monday. Can we please go? I mean, y'all, he was jazzed. And I said, Logan, dude, I'm so sorry, nobody, we cannot go. See, it wasn't like a normal PGA event. It was one of those things where, you know, most clubs are closed on Mondays, but a lot of times an entity will rent out the club and then they'll put on a special private tournament where everybody pays a bunch of money, it all goes to a great cause. You play hooky from work for a day, hang out with your buddies and write it off on your income taxes. They're, real, they're really fun. And I said, Logan, it's, it's not a PGA event. It's not open to the public. We can't go. But Daddy said, it's Larry Nelson. It's a free clinic. And my son loves him, some Larry Nelson. Well, he was relentless. And I caved. Um, now, quick disclaimer, disclaimer. I, I am not sure that what I am about to tell you qualifies as good parenting. So there, it's out there. Finally, I said, okay, look, son, if you're willing to get up at O oh, dark hundred, we might be able to sneak into the tournament before they have security set up. He said, oh, dad, I'm in, I'm in. So sure enough, the following Monday morning, it's O oh, dark hundred. We are sneaking around the house, getting dressed, getting our golf clubs out. We get into the car, we drive to the club, and sure enough, our timing is perfect. The 18-wheeler is still there. They're offloading the tables and the chairs, and they're erecting the tents. And we pull into the parking spot, and I look over at my son. He is white as a sheet, scared to death. I said, okay, look, buddy, just put our clubs on our shoulders. We're going to act like we belong here. Don't say a word. Just follow my lead. He said, okay, Dad. And I said, and don't you ever tell Mom. Well, we hop out of the car, we throw the bags on our shoulders, and we start walking straight to the tournament director's tent. His was already set up. We get about 20 feet away, and he looks up from his clipboard, and he says, oh my gosh, guys, um, whoa, I cannot believe you're already here. Um, we, we're not even ready to sign anybody up. And I said, oh, that's okay. And y'all, we walked right past him. We walked right into the clubhouse, through the clubhouse, out the back door, onto the driving range. Oh my gosh, we set our clubs down and Logan looked up at me with such beaming pride in his face and he said, quote, the eagle has landed. Oh, we were in. If I had died right then, I would have been super dad. Well, we glanced around and Logan said, dad, look, about 40 yards away is this little short guy crushing golf balls, 300 yards. It was Larry Nelson. And we stood there for a couple of minutes and he said, dad, can we get closer? And I'm looking around and I'm thinking, well, if we're going to get kicked out, man, let's go in a blaze of glory. Come on. So we walk down there, and we're just like feet away from him. After about 15 minutes, now there's about 30 people who have done a semicircle around Larry. And y'all, we are watching the most amazing display of excellence we have ever seen. Larry is hitting all the different clubs in his bag, warming up to teach the clinic, right? Practicing, warming up. Well, at this particular moment, he's got a nine iron in his hand, and he is rearing that thing back, and whack, and whack, and y'all, every single ball is landing in the exact same spot. It was freakish. Now, you can tell where he's aiming, because if you've ever been to a golf driving range, there's these gigantic signs. This particular range, they were three feet high and five feet wide. Giant white signs with red numbers. This one said 150. It was the 150-yard marker. Larry has now put 20 shots in a row between the legs of this sign 150 yards away. And he wasn't just hitting straight at it. Some would go straight at it. Some would go right to left. Some would go left to right. But they were landing in the exact same spot. And all of us standing around him with every swing, we'd go. But no one was saying anything. We didn't want to break the magic. Well, I've been silent for far too long, and I love to make people laugh. So I put on my best redneck voice, and I said, just like this, I went, 
hey, Larry, what you aiming at? And everybody fell out laughing. What's he aiming at? Duh, the 150-yard marker. He just put 20 shots in a row between the legs of the sign. Everybody knew what Larry was aiming at. And everybody laughed. But Larry. He stepped away from the ball. He looked over at me and he said, quote, the five. He wasn't just practicing, was he? He was practicing perfectly. He was hitting every shot with excellence because he wanted to develop a habit of excellence. If the only way he hit the ball was excellently, then the only way he hit the ball was with excellence. How do we apply that to our practices, to our lives? Well, let me ask you this. If you answer the phone differently when your boss is standing in the front office, then when your boss isn't, one of them is an act. If you speak to colleagues differently when the doctor is in the room than when the doctor is not, one of those is an act. If, if you speak to your children in the car differently than you did five minutes ago in church, one of them is an act. And y'all, if we want to truly be about excellence all the time, then we've got to learn to develop habits of excellence. And I want to share with you an amazing, simple excellence exercise that will allow you to pull that kind of intentional excellence into any area of your life. Now, all you got to do is first kind of identify what is an area that I'd like to intentionally build excellence in. So let's just say, I don't know, let's say that some negative attitudes maybe have been sneaking into the office. And as you're thinking one evening, you think, man, this, this place just seems down. It didn't seem to be as upbeat as it was. And I know everybody on the team wants this to be an upbeat, positive place to work. I think we're going to intentionally build excellence into the attitudes of our practice. So here's what you do. Five simple steps. Step number one. First thing you want to do is just pull the team together. Get everybody involved together, sitting around a conference table, team huddle, whatever you want to do. Then you introduce the idea of intentionally building excellence into our lives. Introduce the topic that you want to focus on. Number two, in this case, let's be known as the practice in our community where all of the team members have the most amazing attitudes. And then what you do is you get everyone to play. Let's brainstorm together what excellence in attitude looks like. And you get people to chime in. Kimberly, what do you think excellence looks like? She would say, oh, it's positive. Good answer. And you write down positive. Uh, how about you, Marilyn? Oh, it's a smile on your face. Good one. Excellence is a smile. Excellent attitude is a smile on your face. Um, get everybody. It's a can-do attitude. It's how can I help? Heck, take a page out of the Chick-fil-A playbook. You ever eaten there? You say anything to an employee. Do you know what they respond? My pleasure. That's what an excellent attitude looks like. So you brainstorm it. A flip chart, a whiteboard, a legal pad. Then, once you've exhausted what an excellent attitude looks like, you switch gears. And now, you identify and list all of the opposites. If this is what excellence and attitude looks like, this is what it does not look like. And you generate a list of what a poor attitude looks like. Then, once you've got those two lists side by side, you try to gain agreement from everybody on the team. You say, all right, do we all agree this is what excellence looks like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we all agree this is what it does not look like? Absolutely. Okay, let's decide to always be this list or do this or exude this. And let's agree we're not going to be this or do this or exude this. You get total gain agreement and buy-in because, let's face it, everyone wants to work someplace where the attitudes are positive and uplifting and encouraging. All those delicious things that you just created on this side of the list. And here's the last and the key step. Once you've got everybody together and we've all just had this great experience listing what it looks like and what it doesn't look like, here's where the rubber hits the road. And you might even want to lead the way. Y'all, I truly want to be like this too, but I am so not perfect. And y'all, I know there are going to be days that even though I want to be this, 
I'm going to be this. So let's decide right now as a team, when any of us gets off track, how can we lovingly and professionally and gently nudge each other from this list back over to this list? While you've got everybody together, discuss how exactly you're going to go about doing that. These are five simple steps to help you intentionally build excellence into any area of your life. You could choose how we greet people when we walk in. We can choose what excellence looks like in cleaning up our room at home. This is a wonderful, simple strategy. Enjoy it. It is so much fun to make progress on purpose. I'm Dave Weber. Thanks for 15 minutes of your life.